Okay. Hey, everyone. Hello. We'll give it a moment for everybody to get settled and join. I know, hitting the like OK button once we make a webinar go live. I always get confused. What am I doing? What am I pressing? So I'll give it another minute or two. Thanks for joining everyone. All right. How are we doing? We're looking pretty good. Okay. All right. Is everybody ready? Are my panelists all ready? Are we good to go? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Linnea Hiesel, and I am the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Warrior Scholar Project. And we're really excited to have you all with us today for our Native American Women Veterans Panel, where we have some great discussion um, and just conversation about the intersections of what it means and the experiences of being a woman veteran um, who identifies as Native American or a part of the indigenous community. And so while I don't identify as a veteran, I'm a military spouse, um, but, um, and I see my husband is joining us. So hopefully that means I can't tell stories about him, I guess. But um, I have understood the intersections in terms of not everybody's experience with our connection with the military is the same and how cultures bring us together and shape us in terms of the intersections of in institutions. So military as an institution, higher education as an institution, um, how we're brought up and our experiences and cultural uh, experiences impact and shape that, um, so to speak. So that's what brings us here today for our conversation. And so before I introduce our panelists who are really just gonna knock you out of the park, I just wanted to take a moment to um, provide a land acknowledgement. Um, and so a land acknowledgement engages all present in an ongoing indigenous awareness to enact meaningful and reciprocal relationships with ancestors and contemporary tribal nations. We have the opportunity to partake in a shared responsibility to include and support indigenous communities and sovereign tribes. Today, I'm calling from Springfield, Virginia, formerly inhabited by the Doeg ancestors, where I give greetings and gratitude for this land. And if you are interested in learning a little bit more about Native American and indigenous tribe and nation history, you can learn more by going to Native Land Digital, where we'll put a link in the chat um, and you can uh, start your journey in learning this. And hopefully today's conversation will provide you some context in terms of how you can be more involved, how you can be an ally and how you can support um, based upon the regions that you live in. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our amazing panel. Um, I'm going to start with um, Brittany Domine, who served as an electronics technician in the Navy for six years. Brittany is a Northern Arapaho and grew up in the Wind River Indian Reservation. She attended WSP Humanities course at Harvard University in 2020, as well as the Community College Workshop at Grass Grossmont College in 2019. She graduated from San Diego State University with a BA in Anthropology and American Indian Studies, where she worked as a student mentor and grading assistant at the university's Native Resource Center. She was also a recipient of the Sen Sentinels of Freedom Bridge to Education Scholarship. We also have along with us Vanessa Long, who is a US Army veteran and member of the San Carlos Apache tribe. She attended WSP at the University of Notre Dame in 2022. She holds a bachelor's degree in applied management from Palangelo College of Business at Grand Canyon University. She is employed as an accountant and has worked in finance for about five years. She plans to pursue a master's in business administration with an emphasis in accounting and finance. 
And finally, we also have Christy Peterson, who I may slip up and say Christine, because that's how I've always known her um, during my time at Georgetown. But she is a U.S. diplomat posted at the U.S. consulate in Tijuana, Mexico, where she provides citizen services to victims of serious crimes. Chrissy is a registered member of the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma, but grew up in Oregon and attended some schooling on the Warm Springs Reservation, where her mother currently serves as a tribal court judge. Prior to her first tour in the Foreign Service, Chrissy worked on civilian security issues for Congressman Seth Moulton as a consultant for the Center for Civilians in Conflict and interned for a myriad of organizations, including the UNHCR, Mercy Corps, CARE, and the United U.S. Department of State while pursuing her undergraduate and graduate studies at Georgetown University. Chrissy's work is informed by her enlistment in the Marine Corps, where she served as an Arabic cryptolinguist for five years. Chrissy attended Warrior Scholar Project weeks after transitioning out of the Marine Corps and credits the program with assisting in her transition to Georgetown. Chrissy is a Pat Tillman and Harry S. Truman Scholar. Whew, that was a lot. I think I need some water for that. Um, but, you know, reading your bios, um, and I, I feel like I'm shortchanging all of you based upon um, just what's listed there, but these are all what's really important is your lived experiences. And so Brittany, I'm gonna start with you. Um, tell me a bit about your journey in deciding to serve in the military. What influenced you? How did you come to make that decision? Did your experiences in the military align with what you thought it would be and the decision that you made? Uh, sure, thanks. Um, I joined the Navy, I was 19. Uh, I turned 20 in boot camp, but um, I graduated high school and then I was going to my local community college while also working at the casino as a, I was a table games dealer. Uh, but I just, I was getting tired of school and then I was also just going through, it seemed like a bunch of random little things like me and a guy had just broken up and that was just throwing it all. And then uh, my mom, um, both my parents actually were in the Navy. Um, they were stationed in San Diego, so I was actually born at Balboa Hospital, but my mom had asked me even when I was in high school if I would want to join the military when I got out, and I was like, absolutely not, but a year and a half later, <laughs> it seemed like a good idea, uh, but I joined because I know I wanted something different, and then I mostly chose Navy because I think it was, you know, my parents, we only have, I believe it's just the Army recruiter in my town, so my Navy recruiter was actually two hours away in another one, uh, but I just knew that I, I was tired of school. I didn't want to be, um, I loved working at the casino, but then there was also stuff going on there. And I just didn't want to feel like I was stuck, I guess, in my hometown. Uh, a lot of people tend to, because I'm from a very small town in Wyoming and also the reservation I grew up on, like right outside of town. And I feel like a lot of people kind of get stuck there, not that they want to be. So I decided to know that the Navy might be a good idea. And so I joined that. And then I think I liked it for the most part. And it was kind of what I expected. Just a lot of policies, even just little things like day to day that could be changed. But when you try and suggest it, you just get told the whole thing of, um, well, this is how we've always done it. So it doesn't get fixed very often. I've compared it a lot to seeing someone eating soup with a fork and you suggest a spoon that they say that they're gonna continue that way. Um, but no, I'm definitely still grateful for the military. I don't think I would have ended up seeing San Diego uh, had it been otherwise. When I got out, I stayed here, I went to school. Um, I currently work here. He's a, um, I'm an assistant archeologist with a uh, cultural resource management firm. So we, go out and survey or also excavate, but I get to work with uh, the tribes out here, which is really nice with board cultural resource management. And, um, I don't know, I feel like I'm definitely always gonna be grateful to the military. May not have been exactly what I expected, but it brought me, you know, say things like Warrior Scholar Project. I obviously would have never heard about this had it not been for that. I met so many other student veterans that do so much more than I probably could ever even dream of, um, but, I don't know. I feel like it definitely gave me a very good foundation for things. And then it gave me, you know, the opportunity to go to school um, and then the opportunity to not have to say be in debt 
as majority of the people that I even work with now that are paying off student loans and they have been for 10, 15 years, things like that. Uh, so I don't know, I'm always gonna be grateful for it, I guess. And I feel like it did give me a good foundation and it did help, I guess, get me to where I am. That's great, thank you. Vanessa, how about same question? Um, can you share a little bit about what prompted you to uh, serve in the military? Um, were there specific um, influences in your life that you know helped you make that decision? Um, hello, um, we say Dagote in Apache. Um, I kind of related a lot to what Brittany said. Um, especially if you grew up on a reservation, it kind of feels like confinement. Um, you feel like that's all you know. And I think a lot of people feel that way if you've grown up on there. I spent my entire life there. I never left. So my military experience was the first time that I actually experienced living away from the reservation. Um, but I felt like Again, a lot of what Brittany said, um, you really, I really didn't have a direction, a purpose. I was trying to figure out my place. And I think we're all here for something. We're all meant for different things and to serve in different ways. And the, the military was how I did it. That was my way. And um, it was just like, I decided to do it. I'm going to do it. And I went to a recruiter and once I set my mind to something, it's pretty set. So like once I signed up within those three months of just going in first entering the recruiter's office to like actually leaving to MEPS to get ready for basic training, I was already promoted to E1 because I was so set on like, I'm reading everything, I'm studying everything, I'm practicing things. And I had already received my first promotion before I even left just because I was so like, this is it, this is what I'm doing. And uh, there's nothing that's gonna change my mind. <laughs> but um, it was definitely a culture shock because having never lived off the reservation and um, I stay in a pretty rural <laughs> reservation. It's not close to any cities or any major cities. Um, even the nearest town is pretty small. So for me, it was a real culture shock, but it was, um, being independent for the first time in a while and realizing that I can step out of those boundaries and I can be a part of something bigger than just the, that those boundaries, that confinement, it was empowering. Thank you for that. Thank you so much, Vanessa. That was really insightful, especially hearing your experience of not you know, being exposed to other parts of the world until you join the military and being able to leave um, the, the tribe. So thank you. And then same for you, Chrissy, uh, same question. What prompted you to um, join the, the military, the Marines? Um, what influences did you have in terms of making that decision? Um, yeah, so for me, um, I think my story is like a lot of people's in the sense that I was a military kid. And so for me, it was the norm that somebody would join the military um, in my family. So I, I grew up um, in Okinawa when my dad was a Marine there and then came back to Oregon. And that, that's when I, sorry, Mexico just scored. <laughs> um, um, Anyway, so I came back and then we ended up going back to Okinawa again, where my mom was a civilian lawyer for the military because I loved it so much. And I always talk about my, how I like never really, I developed my identity, my identity as a Native American, because whenever I used to go on the res, I was quite young. Um, the Warm Springs Reservation, which also isn't my reservation. I'm from, from Oklahoma. Um, but there's just like so many different stories of displacement. So like my family, like my grandparents, for instance, were moved to Northern California into projects um, in the 50s and 60s, I wanna say, um, in order to develop the area economically. Um, so taken from the reservation, well, not to incentivize off of the res into these projects. And um, so most of my family is from Northern California and then migrated up to Oregon. Um, and so, we primarily like grew up on and off the Warm Springs Reservation. 
Um, but of course, when I was in Okinawa, I had no connection to that, right? And then went back to Okinawa twice, came back. And when I was about 17, for me, I knew I wanted to be a diplomat. I didn't actually know what that was. I was like, I was like an MUN nerd uh, in high school. So I was like, oh, I really want to do this. And I felt like I needed the structure of the military in order to like be successful. I didn't have a lot of self-confidence that like I could go to a big state school and succeed there. Thought I would just like party all the time kind of thing. Um, and so I surprised my parents by telling them I wanted to join the military when I was 17. And then I just chose the Marine Corps specifically because my dad told me to join the Air Force. And I was like, no, <laughs> that's, that's what I ended up. That's amazing. And so thank you for sharing that, uh, Chrissy. And, you know, a common theme that I'm picking up on some of your stories is one, there were recruiters, you know, right there within mm -hmm. your, you know, whether your reservation or within your tribe or in your case, Brittany, it was, you know, Navy was two hours away. You picked the right one as a Navy spouse, but, um, <laughs> You know, but this also common thread of generational. Um, so, you know, you, you decided to join the military because somebody that you were connected to in terms of your parents was serving. So I'm curious to know, do you all or can you share a bit? And this is for anybody in terms of like this rich and complex history of Native American indigenous cultures and the military, whether or not that is the military forcefully moving people, or, you know, um, we think about um, translating and things into code in the Navajo or just serving in the military. Do you have it, like, was any of that shared with you all when you were growing up in terms of service? Yeah, Vanessa? I think um, for me, the most infamous thing that everyone knows about is um, the capturing of Geronimo and that dates all the way back to like the mid to late 1800s. And with that um, kind of stemmed the start of the Apaches relations and service with the military with the Apache scouts. And that um, I still hear about that a lot even today while I was in the military. It's just has this like persona of like bravery and strength because when I was in the military and people would be like what are you what do you mean what am I <laughs> and I and then I realized they meant like you know like what's your background what where are you from or whatever and I would tell them I was Apache and they're just like "Ooh, Apache like it still has like its legendary status today but I know a lot of our history like Fort Huachuca and that base out there, a lot of it had to do with um, the Apache scouts working with the government um, and the enlistment of Native Americans at that time. Thank you for that, Vanessa. Um, I'll just say, I think, I think for me, it's a um, always kind of bittersweet talking about the just ducks position of like serving in the military or even in the U.S. government and being Native American um, for many reasons. I just dealt with this this morning because we somebody wrote an op-ed, like a, a US diplomat just wrote an op-ed about like the grand history of how the US has always respected sovereignty of tribal nations. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> and um, so I think it, it, the thread comes through right now, right? Um, and I was thinking about this the other day, like across the border into San Diego and Barrio Logan's like a really interesting historic Mexican-American neighborhood. And they have a VFW there that is just, it's really powerful and moving. They have like an inscription on the wall talking about like the many Mexican-Americans that served in the military. But then you see in Tijuana, we have deported veterans, right? And so, I don't know, it's very bittersweet. And I think that you can only face it for me when I think about I know those things obviously aren't the same, but they're similar in my mind with in terms of serving for a country that maybe has historically mistreated um, your people, your family, your tribe, whatever it may be. Um, and I, for me, 
I've always thought about it, like just like keeping your eyes open kind of and never whitewashing. And even like now as a diplomat rep representing the United States overseas, it's really important for me to like have a very firm line in terms of um, never denying these things. Um, and also being like very straightforward about the faults of the US government throughout history. Um, and I was like, in prep for this, I was like looking up statistics because I knew I had read somewhere that like, we're disproportionately represented in the military. I think it's like 1.4% of the population in the United States, Native American and 1.7% of the military. And, and it's also really hard to take, to separate the socioeconomic divisions, right? And perhaps the element of like, maybe predatory recruiting um, and that's not always the case. And clearly we all made our own choices and I don't want to simplify that either, but, but uh, there definitely is an element to it where it's like, if you subjugate a peoples for a long time and take away their land and, um, you know, limit their resources, X, Y, Z, and then, wow, lo and behold, this group is across the board, uh, tends to have lower socioeconomic status than other groups easier to recruit. So I, I think it's hard to rectify all of those things. And it's like, you have to keep them all in mind at the same time. And then like, depending on how you wake up in the morning, you feel good or bad about it. Um, I don't know, it's complex. We had like a heated conversation about uh, something along those lines in our uh, program at Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. It was brought up about the most recent, um, how do you feel about the most recent incident where we kind of booked it out of uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, the whole, you know, the operation. And um, one guy was really gung ho about, you know, he was really upset, like, you know, we're the United States Army, we should never did that, like, we should hold to our word. And so I kind of had to chime in and was like, well, they have a long history of doing this to Native Americans. Yeah. saying that they're going to help and they're going to do this. Like even with the Apache scouts, a lot of those Apache scouts were betrayed. They were sent off away from the reservation. And it, it, it is a history. It, there is an issue with that that is sometimes not acknowledged or overlooked. That's powerful. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I mean, I think it's... Um, even today, um, you know, President Biden made the announcement in terms of some intentional work that his government is going to do. And one of the key highlights that I remember coming from that was he's going to make every federal agency go under some form of, he's calling it like consulting training. I'm not entirely sure what that means, but we'll see what that means. But with it being every federal agency, I'm assuming that's gonna impact the VA and the DOD in some capacity, but consultancy, he was making very clear is a two-way conversation, not the US government telling tribes and nations, this is how we're going to move forward with certain policies. It's gonna be a consultation two ways where we're getting feedback from the tribes and nations. So we'll, we'll see if history uh, changes um, based upon some of this, uh, some of these announcements that were made today, for sure. Brittany, did you have anything to add? I, I felt like you were really ready to go with something to chime in there. So I wanted to make sure I, I captured it. Oh, no, not quite. I felt like we both made very good points, but it was, I don't know, it's just definitely kind of funny when you do kind of look back and you, uh, like Chrissy mentioned, that whole juxtaposition, because uh, I think a lot of groups can just view that with the military and stuff in general because it's like you join and I think in my family it was uh it's definitely just kind of one of those ways to I guess like get out of the reservation I believe that's why my mom had joined also she joined as soon as uh she went and signed up and left for boot camp within like three weeks of graduating high school um but no that whole thing about you know you get people saying things like the government's always like what was it um stuck by their word basically with sovereignty and it's Oh, it's just laughable but it's like you don't want to I guess just laugh at it because it's a serious matter but I think it's also just one of those things where um talked about it in a few of my classes but like Native Americans we obviously have like our own kind of sense of humor with certain things 
and there are just a lot of stuff where it's like you kind of have to laugh at it because and just I guess eventually hope that it does get better like how you mentioned Biden's policies and I guess I don't know we'll just believe it when we see it yeah no that's that's insightful and so something that comes to mind, and this came up a little bit earlier too, you know, joining the military, there was a little bit of a culture shock and it was intentional in joining the military to be able to be exposed to different experiences outside of your reservation and so forth. And so um, a very famous, um, we use her work a lot in sociology, but she's a, a feminist scholar, uh, Gloria Nzadula, who discusses in her books, um, Borderlands La Forti uh, Forterna, uses the metaphor that borderlands is used to describe how individuals navigate cultural norms that are socially constructed. Meaning, so in this particular case, um, you know, westernized cultures, how to dress, how to eat, and so forth. Um, and that's what creates this new reality. But you know, native and indigenous cultures have their own culture. And so sometimes being able to navigate both worlds creates this, this split mind, so to speak, or the split reality. And so when I think about your experiences going into the military, but then coming from the military and transitioning back into the civilian world, do you think that there were experiences or lessons that being from your native and indigenous cultures going into the military prepared you for transitioning into the civilian sector? Yeah, go ahead, Brittany. Yes. Um, I think perhaps in a way I was mostly raised like by my grandmother and I feel like that tends to happen a lot on reservations, especially mine, you end up getting raised by grandparents. Uh, but my grandmother, she just taught me to be extremely like independent with things. And so I've always tried to, I guess, like find the answers uh, for myself. So I feel like one of those things of when I was getting out of the military and I wanted to go into school. And so using the GI Bill, I looked up a lot of stuff, I guess, on my own. So then when majority of my friends were getting out because I felt like I was the first within my little like peer group that was getting out. So I had to navigate a lot of things on my own. Um, I'm like the test dummy for all my friends. So then I'm the one who figured out, say, how to like make your claims through the VA or uh, start with the GI Bill. And then later on when I applied for um, the VRNE, things like that. Uh, I don't know. I feel like that's like kind of a cultural thing, or at least like within my family, we're we were all raised, especially the women in my family. I know that we do come from also a matriarch, but we're all very extremely independent and get taught, you know, to do a lot of things. And then my grandmother just always, you know, instilled in me that I needed to, I guess, like focus on myself and try and always do things for myself and whatever was best for me and not necessarily, um, I guess, worry about how it could affect other people. And I don't, know if that's necessarily a cultural thing or say like my grandmother's type of thing but I know I've met a lot of people in the service and even now like as an adult I'm almost 32 but I don't know I meet a lot of people where they're very very concerned about I guess like what their friends or family think about them doing things whereas my family and my grandmother's always been like just go do what it's best for you and I think a lot of people base decisions differently uh, but I feel like that's almost how my whole family is and it's almost like to a fault but I don't know I was gonna say um not to contradict I actually was thinking about this and had a different like actually the opposite in the sense that for me culture shock both being in the civilian world especially going to school reminded me a lot of the cultural shock I have between my husband and I um, in the sense that like my family's huge and it's very communal. And um, so it's not exactly the same thing, right? Like you can be individualistic, but still like take care. I don't know. But, um, but anyway, so my family's really communal and it's very much like if someone can't pay the bills this week, you know, an aunt or a cousin or someone will help or if someone needs a place to stay or live for like, you know, however long it will get dealt with. 
Um, and it's very much like that communal attitude. And you saw that it's not exactly the same in the military because you don't have the same level of need, right? Because most of your needs, your basic needs are met. But, you know, if you needed to go to the doctor and couldn't drive yourself back from the hospital for like whatever reason, obviously someone would help you. Like you just look out for each other kind of in a way that really didn't exist when I got out of the military. And I saw that the same way. Um, as like my, my, my family compared to my husband's family, which is like, they're all just like, I always say they're just like adults going through the world. Like, I don't know, like whenever I explain to him, like my family structure and how like just, and it, and it can be really messy. Right. Um, because like my mom's the first in her whole family to go to college, much less law school. And so she ends up, um, it's like generational poverty, right? So it's not like her coming out and then it's like, oh, she's made it. She went to college. It's like, no, now she's the one that, you know, pays people's bills who can't pay them. And like, she becomes the harbor for like people who don't have a house right now, like second cousins and whoever it might be. And then, so it takes a couple of generations to really like pull out of that. Um, and so, and so that's like very normal to me. Um, and being in the military, you saw some of that, right? Like people will be there for you if you need them, even if they don't want to be. And I think that reminds me of my family too. Like, even if you don't want to be, it's like, well, if no one shows up for you, then someone will get in trouble kind of thing. Whereas like, for me, that was kind of shocking being in college. You just didn't see that. I mean, and obviously also going to college, like Billy Madison style, everyone was also so much younger. So they're just like, whatever they're focused, on. but there was just like the real lack of communal ness there. Um, and then in the, the civilian sector in general, you often don't see it as much. So it's nicer to be around veterans sometimes, especially women veterans um, for like the camaraderie and support um, and particularly camaraderie and support when it's like not comfortable or like not easy, if that makes sense. Thank you. Vanessa, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I believe I um, I had more uh, issues with, I think the term was code switching um, with my educational environment more than I did in my military environment. Um, in the military, I survived by being the stereotypical, strong, silent Apache type. Um, but in higher education, I felt like I had to carry myself different. I went to high school off the reservation. So I kind of already experienced that. I had to get on the bus at like 5.30 in the morning and go like, you know, 20 miles away with some stops on the way. So um, I made that trek every morning just to go to school off the reservation in high school. So I kind of already had that experience. and. I kind of know what it's like to code switch and kind of make yourself presentable, forget your slang, forget that they don't understand some of the words that you're saying or your slang. So, but I think coming out of the military, being Native American, I just know I can only speak for where I'm from. A lot of the Native Americans, they do go home uh, despite feeling like a prison and a confinement, it's all you know, and it's home. And a lot of people, they go home and they don't go home to anything, you know? So I feel like the transition is rough because the resources aren't there for Native American veterans in particular. Um, Brittany mentioned she was a guinea pig and uh, there are a lot of veterans, even the older generation veterans that have never gotten the benefits that they deserve, have never filed for their, um, you know, their claims, have never done anything even still to this day because where I'm from, there's not a lot of resources. So hopefully um, my whole aim and my whole platform for speaking out and, you know, being a representative of the tribe, being a female veteran is to try to get those resources out there because they, they're they almost non-existent and it makes the transition even harder than it has to be. That's, that's really powerful, Vanessa. And it reminds me 
Um, there's another Tillman scholar, um, his name is Jameson, who does a lot of work on, you know, how there's a lack of data because of, in some cases, it's because the government doesn't know where to look or isn't intentionally looking to get, you know, meaningful data to help build policies to best support, um, you know, Native and Indigenous populations. So I'm curious to hear from your perspective, what types of support and resources would be helpful for transitioning veterans who identify as being Native Americans or Indigenous? I feel like the first step would be for our own people like myself to come in and speak up for them because as we spoke earlier about the government and betrayals, it, it, they will trust someone that they know that is where they're from, like, you know, us group of like Native American veterans, you know, that that's a network. And I feel like it would take an internal network, first of all, to come in a lot of tribes. I feel like they don't trust the government. Their whole, a lot of the aim is to protect our rights, protect our land, you know, all of those things. So they're a little bit hesitant to work with the government to get those resources, to get that information. That's why it's non-existent. You know, they're more set on protect our own, protect our people. They don't let a lot of people in. Um, but some of the resources that I think would be helpful, healthcare, a lot of um, people need their veterans benefits. Uh, a lot of the older veterans, even like we have a veterans association for the tribe that I participate in. So a lot of the older veterans are Vietnam veterans. A lot of them I feel like could use the health care, they could use counseling, they could use all of those benefits. And um, there is another younger generation of veterans who are coming home and we have our own college now. We have uh, Apache College um, that offers college courses and somewhere for them to feel like they can better themselves and they can go to school to kind of collaborate with the VA and using those education benefits where they're, they can do it at home. Mm. That's really insightful. And, you know, it also kind of reminds me a little bit in terms of like, how do we get, you know, programs like Warrior Scholar Project, if, especially if they're, um, you know, looking to further their education, providing uh, that community of resources. And I don't know if we can empower you all to get, you know, spread that word to get more people um, connected to resources. And it doesn't, you know, we know we don't just do boot camps, you know, we support in other capacities. That one's for you, Cassie Sanchez. Um, and so um, how do we find ways to connect them to those resources? Um, Brittany or Chrissy, did you have any um, anything to add in terms of like, what do you see in terms of tangible resources or services to provide? I will say the only thing I thought of when Vanessa was talking was um, the way that IHS is structured is really interesting. And in comparison to the VA, two things that stood out for me, particularly during the uh, Indian Health Services. Um, so two things that stood out to me specifically during the pandemic that I think the VA could replicate. Um, when the vaccine was available, I was signed up for both lists, the VA and IHS. And IHS, the VA said, if you're a veteran, you can get a vaccine. And IHS said, if you're a federally registered member of a tribe, you and everyone in your household can get a vaccine, even if they're not registered. And the idea there had a lot to do with language and cultural preservation of like native tribal members. Um, but in my mind, it made sense for the VA to have done the same thing, right? Because you have elderly veterans. Um, and a lot of that was just like a real cultural awareness piece, um, or really just like looking at the whole picture um, that maybe the VA could assimilate or could take on, not even just the VA, right, but other veteran service organizations. The other thing that along those same lines, Indian Health Services, so my brother has a lot of mental health issues, and we went to go get our, our vaccines together. And separate from the long tradition of not trusting the US government that a lot of Native Americans have. My brother also separately just like doesn't trust the medical system. <laughs> he has his own things, right? <laughs> but it was so awesome that we got our vaccines at, at IHS because 
because of the long history of mistrust and um, you know, spread of disease of the US government into onto native tribes, all IHS employees, Indian Health Services employees, all of them, oh, first off, a lot of them are Native American themselves. And secondly, they all have to take uh, cultural sensitivity courses and learn about this negative history, which I find really interesting. So when you pull up, it's not like, when you pull up to the VA, it's very much like, you know, here's your shot. Like they don't really tell you what's going on. At IHS, it was very, or at the, the Warm Springs Clinic, that we went to it was like you were very involved in the process and you knew what was happening to you like okay go over here and you're waiting for this go over here and this is the reason why we're asking you to do this and it was very very intentional and there's a reason for that that has to do with a long history um, in my case i really noticed it because my brother was really nervous the whole time and i was so grateful that we were at ihs versus any other facility because they did take that care and that's because they're mandated to i think by the government um, because they have to, by IHS, they have to take these cultural sensitivity classes and training, even if it has nothing to do with your day-to-day -day job, because it has everything to do with why you're there. That makes sense. That was really helpful. Thank you. Um, and I think that kind of gets to the point in terms of maybe that announcement that President Biden was getting to, that IHS has this cultural competency in terms of what consultation looks like and mandating all of the other administrations um, to be able to have similar training and support. So again, TBD, we'll see how this all plays out. Um, so um, that's really helpful. I want to um, be mindful of time and open it up for questions, but we did get a comment um, in the chat here from Greg Sanchez. Um, he stated, you all are very brave and strong women. As, so, as a social historian, I have examined the long history of violence caused by settler colonialism on Native Americans, that the US government has broken every treaty ever entered with tribal communities, but then exploits Native American service members. Their land and their families is a failure of the monolithic proportions. In solidarity, I stand beside each of you and your advocacy work. So um, just wanted to share that note. Um, but yeah, if anyone has questions, we'll free, feel free to um, leave them in the chat or use the Q&A feature, which we have access to. We can definitely open that up. Um, but one thing that I wanted to ask you all, what's next on the horizon? So you all have gone through WSB, done great things in terms of um, pursuing your education, but I'd be curious to know what, what else lies in the future for you all? I'll start with you, Brittany. Um, I would say, I guess, kind of education-wise and then wanting to do a little bit of Native American advocacy work. Uh, sorry, that's my dog. Uh, but so I study anthropology and right now I'm uh, doing archaeology and cultural resource management. But my biggest interest is like biological and forensic anthropology, which has to deal uh, more with, excuse me, sorry, um, like bones and human remains. Well, there aren't a lot of records with, um, you know, Native Americans, which is generally a cultural thing. Like, obviously, we're not the type of people where, say, we want testing done, like, on us or um, anything like that. And then, obviously, there's the whole issues of, like, NAGPRA, where we clearly, I don't know, it's like, I guess we don't want to be just, like, science experiments. But then, at the same time, there's a very, like, hard lack of data. And I think it's one of those things where not even say just distrusting the government, but say even distrusting things like modern science and things that just want to exploit us. Um, so I've always wanted to kind of look into, I guess, some way of, in a way of trying to like bridge that gap because I think it's definitely a lot easier to do so uh, when Vanessa mentioned, you know, if it's someone from like your own group of people um, and I guess trying to find a way to bridge that gap because I think one of the best examples was with the Kennewick man and trying to identify him I believe his remains were 6,000 years old and there were modern scientists trying to claim that you know he wasn't of Native American descent and then this group believing that he was and the only way that they were able to really determine it was they did have to do testing on did the isotope testing on I believe it was a wisdom tooth or something like that 
but you know they had to kind of give in to science a little bit to get the answer and then it was able to prove that he did belong to their tribe so they were able to repatriate his remains um so i would like to somehow find a way to get into work like that i don't know specifically because i feel like it's not really done yet but i feel like that's kind of my big plan with it that's awesome. Pioneering in new opportunities. Um, that is really, really cool. How about you, Vanessa? Um, education wise, I am currently going to be working on my MBA, my master's in business administration. I'm hoping to get enough accounting uh, with an emphasis in accounting because I'm hoping to get enough accounting classes to sit for my CPA. Um, I started off in business with the tribe working in the Department of Finance and Revenue. And so that's where I kind of found my knack and how to help the tribe. Um, I know that we're working towards self-sufficiency with our funding, uh, meaning we could do more with our funding um, versus what the government tells us what we can do with our funding. So uh, that would be my way to make a difference, um, especially with going to the Notre Dame uh, boot camp, that was really inspiring to push more to learn about entrepreneurship and how we can build that up on the reservation because we don't have a lot of that. Like I said, we're in a rural area. Um, there's not too much um, enterprises or Native American entrepreneurs, or there are Native American entrepreneurs. Or there's a lot of artists and people that do things, but they don't even see themselves as entrepreneurs. You are you are entrepreneurs, you are, you can be business people. And who knows, maybe I will be a future leader one day. Or you're one now, don't sell yourself so <laughs> just like the entrepreneurs, you're a leader now. No, this is great. Thank you so much for sharing that. All right, you're up next, Chrissy. Sorry, I'm never going back to school. I don't ever wanna go back. <laughs> Um, my future so um i mean i'm gonna keep fighting a man from the inside mm -hmm. that's my goal um just kidding sort of um i'm headed to islamabad next to the embassy in pakistan um but my long-term goals are the reason i'm in this field is because I want to work on um, refugee and migrant issues. So I do that in my spare time right now, and particularly people displaced by uh, war and conflict, um, which I don't know, I guess I've never really drawn the parallels between like talking about US government displacement of Native American tribes and like maybe how there's a parallel there because a lot of the people that on the issues I worked with are people displaced from Afghanistan and Syria so by the US government, but uh, so that's kind of my, my primary focus in the, in the mid to far future. That's awesome. Um, I'm gonna ask folks if they have questions, feel free to put it in the chat or use the Q&A feature. Otherwise, I'm just gonna keep asking questions. Okay, here's somebody. Okay, this question comes from Ryan Pavel, the CEO of WSP, so no pressure. Um, what can WSP do better to support Native and Indigenous veterans? Um, I'm still waiting for them to come and meet our, uh, our uh, board members, our chairman, come see our college. Let's collaborate, see what maybe our college can do better to help our veterans. Okay. <laughs> I'm here for it. I love it. Other thoughts? Yeah, I think maybe just trying to do a little more outreach and I guess try to reach some of the smaller schools. Cause like I mentioned, I'm from Wyoming and the entire state, we have one uh, university, one four-year institution, that's University of Wyoming, and then it's, I believe, six community colleges in the entire state, and I have a few cousins who are veterans, and most of them have tended to, like, gone back home, so they're going to school, you know, in small town Wyoming, so I think I've, say, tried to, like, spread the word, but it's also one of those things where um, if you just don't know about it, I guess it's just got to kind of get 
tribal college visit that'd be cool we also uh we have a tribal college on my reservation as well um the Arapaho College but I guess just trying to kind of reach out to the actual institutions um in Wyoming I'm from it's a really kind of small town Riverton technically so it's literally the very middle of the state but I grew up like the Wind River Indian Reservation kind of like surrounds that and is also between like Lander there's the movie Wind River that's kind of based on it that's great. I guess it sounds like you guys are going to have like a Native American college tour in the works. <laughs> so jumping from each Native American area and just picking out some colleges and. <laughs> it does, it does. Chrissy, did you have anything to add to that? No. I mean, just out of curiosity, I mean, how was WSP instrumental to you all in your journey in terms of where you are with your career? Because Christy, I know you're not going back to school because I'm no longer at a university anymore, which is why you went to school the entire time I was there. Um, but for others, as you're looking to go to school, are, you know, what was, what was it about WSP that helped you in, in recognizing your intersections of being Native American, a woman veteran pursuing higher ed? For me, um, so for me, I already knew I was going to go to Georgetown and it was like my dream and I'd been accepted. And so I kind of went into WSP a little cocky. And then what I came out of it with was one, a really good community of people at Georgetown that were also veterans, but two, just the ability to um, not code switch necessarily, but put things in perspective. Um, the article that we read on the first day of WSP um, at Georgetown was about another veteran who went to Georgetown and on like orientation day found a, it was like the anniversary of one of his friends dying in Afghanistan and it code switching is not the right term right but being able to compartmentalize I think that and put into context that like the people around you may have not had as much life experience and also might find what your story is to be too heavy or not, it's hard to relate to people, right? Particularly like traditional aged college students, um, especially they're from like really rich bougie families. Like a lot of people I went to school with didn't even know what financial aid was, which blew my, like their parents just literally paid. Like it's just wild. Anyways, so the understanding, like WSP for me was crucial to being able to compartmentalize. Like some people just have different life experiences and, and it's going to be hard to relate to other people and that's okay. It was okay both because I saw in WSP that a lot of people had those experiences elsewhere and also because WSP introduced me to some great people that became my best friends at Georgetown. That's great. Vanessa or Brittany? Um, I think WSP was just a great journey. I was a real door opener. I met a lot of great people and I've had so many good opportunities since then. And I still keep in contact with some of the other students that I went out to Notre Dame with, um, collaborating on different things. And we're all like getting ready to go to school and do all these things. But it's mainly um, a big networking environment for veterans, which is really cool because I don't know why sometimes you don't click with everyone else, but if you're a veteran, like you just kind of automatically like gravitate and click. We all have like, we know our little like military slangs and we all crack the same military jokes and stuff. But um, just that was in itself a, a great experience. And when I went to Notre Dame or before I went to Notre Dame, like I said, my um, code switching was pretty up to par just from being like, going to school off the reservation, but going to WSP kind of broke that and was like, you don't have to code switch. You can be yourself. You can be you and still be great and still accomplish and do great things. And since then, I just been like going and going and accomplishing things and getting the ball moving. And it was just a really good like motivator and a confidence booster to say, you are somebody and you can do it. That's great. Thank you, Vanessa. Brittany, we'll close out with you and then um, we will start wrapping up. 
Um, I'd say it's like very similar to Vanessa, like WSP, it obviously gave me more skills for college. And so then I felt, um, I guess like I actually say belonged there, but I feel like WSP also, um, it kind of wants you to celebrate, I guess, that you're different. Like obviously we focus on being student veterans. So we're different with that. And then, uh, but how she mentioned code switching, because I still definitely do that a lot because I've always had that whole identity issue with, I know that I don't, my dog, <laughs> she, um, but I know that I don't necessarily, I feel like I'm always a little bit of the outsider, like everywhere. Cause you know, it's like um, within my own family, I'm very, very light skinned compared to the majority of people in my family. Cause also uh, I'm half Italian for my dad. Uh, then, you know, you join the military, you're kind of on the outskirts cause you're a woman and then you're also Native American. So it's like, you're just this very, very small uh, bit. And then, you know, same with when you're in college. So I feel like WSP, you know, gave me like these uh, educational kind of skills and then being surrounded by other veterans that do so well, it like just kind of inspires you. But then also I feel like there's a big, uh, like kind of like that we should be proud that we're different and that we should kind of like embrace it. And I felt like that's helped me. And then, yeah, I don't do code switching as much anymore. Vanessa, I throw out a lot of names. So my boyfriend never knows what I'm saying. I can't explain it. Um, I try to, but it's borderline impossible. But yeah, I feel like that's what WSP definitely helped. And I'm sure it helps a lot of other people that are see minorities. Like it just kind of helps bring out like a sense of pride in yourself within like the education system. Powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for everyone. Um, for you, Brittany, Vanessa, and Chrissy, for your sharing your time and your experiences, finding those commonalities, but then also those differences. And it's, you know, definitely a reminder that each veteran's experience, especially when they're transitioning, is not going to be the same. And so um, that's why it's really important for us to take the time and get to know each other on an individual level. Um, so this was beyond insightful. Um, I also just want to, you know, give my extreme gratitude to the WVEDS committee, um, Whitney, Lisa, Lil, Cassie, Samantha, Alina, thank you so much for helping to put on today's events and getting the word out there. And then I will pass it, or before passing it on, you all know me and my poems, I love poems. So I just have a quick closing poem um, called Carrying Our Words by Ophelia Zepeda um, called, yeah, Carrying Our Words. We travel carrying our words. We arrive at the ocean with our words we are able to speak. Of the sounds of thunderous waves, we speak of how majestic it is. Of the ocean power that gifts us songs, we sing of our respect and call it our relative. So thank you all so, so much. I'm going to pass it on to Alina. She's got a couple closing remarks, and then we will close out for today. Thank you, Linnea. And um, thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you, Brittany. I think it's extremely empowering, um, all of your stories. And I just appreciate you all being so transparent and so vulnerable. Um, and, and, you know, I feel so flattered to be able to actually listen and be a part of this conversation. And I would love to have more conversations like this so we can learn more about you and your story and um, for my job specifically, so I can learn about more ways to support you um, as a alumni engagement fellow. So um, for those of you who are interested in donating and supporting for the Warrior Scholar Project, I will link in our donation link. Um, yesterday was Giving Tuesday, so if you missed out on it, you are more than welcome to click the link and donate today. Uh, for those of you who are tuning in and you are a veteran or you know someone who is and they are interested in our academic boot camps, um, here is the link for the interest form. We haven't um, finalized our boot camp dates yet for next summer, but you are still more than welcome to fill out the interest form and we will make sure that we get you going with that. And for any alumni who are tuning in, we still have our fellow application open. So make sure that you apply um, and we will start interviewing for people in around January, February timeframe. Um, so once again, I just wanted to say thank you for everyone and thank you for letting me speak, Linnea.
right, that wraps it up. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.